our church, all while becoming a member. We're now offering Road Track at our College Road venue, beginning Sunday, August 7th at 10 a.m. The Airport Way venue will continue with their classes during the third gathering at 12 p.m. If you've not started Grow Track, start today. Visit truenorthak.org forward slash grow track for this information and more. The first Wednesday of the month is a time of extended worship, prayer, and seeking the Holy Spirit. Encounter Night is a powerful time of experiencing God's presence and seeking Him for healings and miracles. There are activities for your kids as well, so bring the whole family. information on these events and more, be sure to check out the worship guide you received on your way in. And if it's your first time with us, don't forget to fill out the welcome card and get your free cafe drink. Well, good morning, True North Church. How's everyone doing today? You guys having a good day? Hey, we had a bunch of food up here. You're probably thinking, like, what in the world is, you know, we had kids from Mega Sports Camp donate the food. Uh, and it's for Pack the Pantry. So we feed uh, uh, kids at Denali Elementary. We feed, they send food home seven days a week with many of the kids that maybe are, have some hunger, fears, or, uh, uh, but I looked at some of the fruit up here. Send a first grader home a, a can of black beans, okay? That'll make mom and dad happy, right? Or mom and everyone happy. And on top of that, you can put some, uh, some chili sauce. And then wipe it and brush it down your uh, licorice watermelon seeds. I'm sure that that's just absolutely incredible. So, uh, but thanks, parents. We had over 400 kids and leaders here this week. Would you give it up for our volunteers? And, and, uh, and uh, honestly, the first day I walked in, I the parking lot. I mean, people couldn't get into the parking lot to drop their kids off. And so um, there's so many people. So parents, thanks if you brought your kids. for Thanks for coming. Workers, appreciate that. Um, hey, my name's Mark, and oh, I just spilled my, and I'm, I'm one of the pastors here. Um, I want to say thanks for being here. We live stream this gathering, and so, uh, and it is live streamed as well as correctional facilities across the state of Alaska. Would you give it up for those watching online right now? Good correctional facility. We appreciate you, and uh, uh, you know, it's a good day to be alive. Look at your neighbor right now and say, you're looking good. Now, come on. It's too quiet. Look at your neighbor and say, you're looking good. Look at your other neighbor and say, I might have just lied in church. <laughs> no, no. And uh, hey, we have a special guest here today with us, Kelly Chewbacca, running for a U.S. Senate. And so uh, get up for Kelly. Good to have you here. Kelly and her husband, pastor of Four Square Church in, Anch or in Anchorage. And uh, they love the Lord and uh, probably rightly aligned with the, the, the beliefs of, uh, of life is important from conception and uh, marriage between a husband and a wife. And so we appreciate you, Kelly. We're proud that you're running for U.S. Senate. Thanks so much for saying yes to that. And, and uh, we'll be praying for you. Um, if you want to talk to her after service, man, grab her. And, uh, well, no, grab her ear. Don't grab her, okay? Uh, Got to be careful, all culture. Uh, Micah chapter 6. We're in a series called Major Lessons from the Minor Prophets. And I'm super, thank you so much. Uh, I spilled my tea up here. Um, we're, we're in a series on the major lesson of the minor prophets. We're in the book of Micah. Next, next week, next week, I got a quiz real quick. This is a Bible quiz. Next week, we're preaching on the book of Nahum. Has anybody ever heard a sermon from Nahum? Raise your hand real high. Okay, one person. Yeah, how many of you guys have read Nahum? How many of you guys know where the Bible's at? No. Um, 
And so I'm sure you all have a favorite story or verse next week. You guys, next week, Nahum, three chapters, read it, come prepared. Um, probably one of the funnest. We're a Bible church. It would have been easy, I thought. You know, I might skip Nahum. No one's going to know. <laughs> Yeah, they would, because a whole bunch of you like, no, Mark, I've been taking notes every week, putting it in my binder, and you skip Nahum. Nahum, Nahum is a more difficult book to walk through, but next week, we're going we're gonna to walk through that book, talk about the character of God and how he looks at people. It's going to be a lot of fun, so come back. We're excited about that, but we're in Micah today, and uh, here's the premise. The first five chapters of Micah sound like you've read Obadiah and like you've read Amos. We've talked about that. There's social justice issues. There's lying. There's a justice system that's messed up. There's people taking advantage of the poor. There's a lot going on there. We've talked a lot about the last, the last several weeks. That there's 300 times in the Old Testament alone that God talks about taking care of the poor and taking care of the widow and the orphan and the foreigner. God cares a lot about taking care of people who don't have a voice. And in the book of Micah, the first five chapters, God, God goes after the Israelites again. But he also narrows it down and talks about the leaders and the pastors and the shepherds and those in government and those in leading. And, and it, it's, a, it's, it's really, he comes down to, and I want to read Micah chapter 6, verse 1 through 3 to kind of give you the big picture of where this whole launching pad, where today, where, where it, it kind of comes down to, there's the brass tacks of Micah. Listen to what the Lord is saying. Stand up and state your case against me. Let the mountains and the hills be called to witness your complaints. And now, O oh mountains, listen to the Lord's complaints. He has a case against his people. Now, how do you want to know when God says, go ahead and state your case, the mountains and the hills will listen to you. And then he says, oh, but hey, mountains, listen, because I'm going to state my case against my people. How many was that? That's not a fun day. It's a case against his people. He'll bring charges against Israel. Oh, my people, what have I done? This is what God's asking. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? What have I done to make you tired of me? Answer me. He's saying, stand up. Mountains and hills, I'm calling you to witness. And I have a case against you. What have I done to you to make you tired of me? Answer me. So today I want to introduce case 0693 BC God versus his people. Yes. I don't know why you're laughing. Are you guys aware of that, what music that is? I, I, I don't watch television. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm just kidding. Court's now in session. And uh, it's, it's, it's the prosecutor, which is God, and it's the defense, which is the people. And Micah is asking us to join in this courtroom drama between God saying, state your case, and then he says, I have a case against you. There's a tug of war. Chapter 6 and 7. I want to walk through Micah 6 and 7 today. And I want to walk through this court case. And I'll just say this. Probably from the front end, it's the same court case God's asking us to walk through personally in our lives as well. And, and so we're going to hear from the prosecutor first. And so uh, uh, God's, God's asking questions. And here's, here's, if you're taking notes, and I know uh, uh, last, last week we had some melancholics in our church. I didn't get through my notes last, yesterday or today. And I'm sure they're at home like twitching like, I didn't, I just four blanks on here. It's okay. You'll live. Go to the Version Bible app. They're all filled in for you. You can check it out that way. Um, but, the, but the first thing God says is, I have a solid case against you. If God knows everything, how many want to know God has a solid case against all of us? Okay? And I've got to listen to what the Lord's saying. Stand up, state your case against me. Mountains and hills, you're, you're, the, you're, you're, you're the witnesses, you're, you're here. But, but God says, I have a complaint against you. So what we're going to see is God's case, the people's defense, God's case, the people's defense, back and forth. How many want to know that we all, when you read that, it says, it says mountains and hills, they're going to be the witnesses. How many want to know that we're all without an excuse because of creation? It says in Romans. That, that you just look at the creation, there's no excuse 
Uh, you can see God and what God is doing, his handiwork. And, and, and so God has a case against Israel and Micah. God has a case against us in, in, in life. And if God is the God of the Bible, guess what? God has a case against us because there's some things in the Bible that we don't always line up to. And this is the first thing he says in his case against them. It's number one, uh, or secondly, you, you have forgotten your salvation and your freedom. In Micah chapter 6, verse 4, it goes on. Micah says, for I brought you out of Egypt. We sing that song today. I brought you out of Egypt, and I redeemed you from slavery. I sent Moses and Aaron and Miriam to help you. <laughs> I brought you out of where? Egypt. I brought you out of the world power of the day. I brought you out of the greatest empire on planet Earth at the time. I gave you Moses. I gave Moses a stick. And that stick touched the Red Sea. And, and, and what happens? Boom. It touches the Nile River. It turns to blood. It touches the ground and lice come from it. it, it, it God brought them out with ten incredible miracles that each judged. One of, the, one, one of the gods that was so high up in the thinking and the intellect of the Egyptian people. God was, God was drawing lines. I brought you out of Egypt. I gave you Moses. Not just Moses. I gave you Aaron because Moses had a stern problem. He's like, I can't, can't, can't go. And God goes, oh, don't use an excuse. I'll give you a mouthpiece. I'll give you a prophet named Aaron. And Aaron was Moses' mouthpiece. Because God, God, God will give us all a stick and a stutter. How many want to know that? God will give us something that keeps us humble and something we, that, are, that, that just shows the glory of God through us. Amen. And God, I gave you Miriam. In other words, I gave you the law. I gave you the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And guess what? We sing a song, or someone should write a song like this. Hey, he splits the Red Sea so they can walk right through it. He says, have you forgotten what I did? Have you forgotten that I redeemed you from slavery? I sent my, and, and, and I set people on you. In other words, what he's saying is, is why in the world are you living like this when I delivered you so you wouldn't have to live like this. My, my, my uh, father-in-law is 80 years old, and, and my wife is in Portland right now celebrating a huge uh, family reunion. There's 280 people that came to this reunion. Now, how many of you guys would like to go to a family reunion with that many people? <laughs> it's a lot of people. And uh, I, my, my father-in-law had like 11 brothers and sisters, and like eight of them are still alive. And so it's a big family reunion. And, uh, but what I love about my father-in-law, he's 80 years old, and... Uh, He's, he's on the last stage of pancreatic cancer right now. But every time you're with my father-in-law, he'll tell you about how Jesus delivered him and set him free. My father-in-law has never forgotten that he woke up in jail because he was drunk and he beat the snot out of people. He doesn't forget the fact he was in Mexican gangs at one time. He doesn't forget that he was on drugs and alcohol. And there was a day he had drugs and alcohol and alcohol and drugs had him. And then God delivered him and set him free one time at an altar on a Sunday morning that he walked into a revival at a camp, at a camp meeting. He, my father-in-law, he's 80 years old on his deathbed and he still talks about how he was set free and delivered. Friends, can I tell you something? Anyone here glad God set you free and delivered you? Your blood bought, Christ centered, God governed, heaven headed, demon delivered, Pentecostal preaching, almost tongue talking. Uh, we, we are people who we, we can't forget what God has done. And God says, I have, Nate through Micah, I have a problem with you. I have a case. You've forgotten what I've done. See, what he said is remember what I did for you. Friends, the last time you get your chin on your chest, start talking about all the times God delivered you and what he did for you, and you'll get your chin off your chest pretty quick and realize God has done more for you than we ever deserve. Number three, I think the next thing in this case the prosecutor says, don't blame me for your mistakes. Don't blame God. Let's take that word blame for a second. B, L. A-M-E. Let's take the B off. Don't be lame. When you blame, you're being lame. Because we're going to see as we go forward, the Israelites start to point all the fingers as to why their, their world's messed up and why they're not serving Jesus, and they could point all the fingers, and God's kind of says, stop blaming. Don't 
be lame. See, it goes on in verse five. Don't you remember, my people, how King Balak of Moab tried to have you cursed? I'm sure you guys all know who King Balak of Moab is, right? We'll talk about him. Some of you all know who he is. They tried to have you cursed, and how Balaam, son of Beor, blessed you instead. And remember your journey from the Achaia Grove and Gilgal, when I, the Lord, did everything I could to teach you about my faithfulness. Gilgal is where they were circumcised before they went to the promised land, and God rolled their reproach away. But, 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 but on their way from the promised land, they walked through a place, a journey through a place called Moab. And King Balak was the king of Moab. And all of a sudden, he wakes up one day, and he realizes there are a million people walking through his valley. Now, how many want to know that would make you pretty insecure when you hear about the great exploits that there's a guy named Moses, and he has a stick, and he split the Red Sea, and the Egyptians drowned in all the water and all the plagues, and so now God's people are walking through your land, and you're like, oh, no, not me. This is not going to be good for my, for like my, my re-election case. And, and so they say, well, you know, we, we should, uh, uh, you know, there, there's a guy named Balaam. He's a prophet. And uh, every, anything he pl- blesses is blessed. Anything he curses is cursed. So let's pay him to curse the Israelites. And so they go and they find Balaam and they say, hey, listen, our king wants to give you lots of gold. And all you have to do is stand on the hilltop and curse the Israelites. And he's going to pay you. He goes, I don't work for money like that. I don't, I don't say what people want me to say. I say what God wants me to say. There's a difference between working for people and working for God. And he says, so, 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 so Balaam takes him up. They take him up to the high, a high place to look over the Israelites. And, and he says, okay, curse him. And he goes, Lord, bless you. And Balaam's like, no, 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 no. I told you, curse him. Take him to another place. Curse him. And then the Lord goes, and he goes, I, the Lord blesses you. And he's like, no. And four times Balaam says, bless, curse them. And four times Balaam blesses them. So King Balaam goes, I gotta try a different, I gotta try a different strategy here. And so read Numbers chapter 22, 23, 24, 25 this week. Go study it. Balak, King Balak of Moab goes down and he finds the most handsome men in the community and the most beautiful women in the community. And he says, go. Take our gods and go intermarry with the Israelites. Let them be attracted to your beauty and take our gods and mix worship because the blessing of God is on them because they have one God. He's their God. They've got the Ten Commandments. So guess what? Let's go mess that whole thing up. And that's what happened. He says, he says listen, he says, you, in other words, they, they, they backslid because of sex and because of worshiping God their way rather than God's way. Now, how many want to know that sounds a lot like America? Amen. I didn't get a lot of shouts right there. But the reality is, 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 is that King Balak was a pretty smart guy. He, he knew how to get God's people to compromise, and God's people are still compromising the same way today. But guess what? We can't blame other people for our own choices. We, when we walk away from God's book and God's commands and God's decrees and do things our ways, God has a case against his people. The next, as we read the text, it shifts now from prosecutor to defendants. There we go. I'm going to keep you awake at least four times today. All right. Defendants. Here's their response. Now, anyone here, anyone here have daughters? Now, the only reason I say that is my son is eight years old, and I haven't seen yet how he's going to manifest as a 16-year-old when he gets in trouble. But I have four daughters. And they're half Mexican, and they have big brown eyes. And, 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 when, I, and, and, and when I, it's, it's probably my part of the family that causes them to do what I'm going to say next, not their wife's part. Because um, my wife's a saint. Um, she's my BMW, my beautiful Mexican wife. Um, but but uh, uh, when, when my daughters don't like what dad says, they roll their eyes. Anyone ever seen an eye roll? You know what I'm talking about? And how many of you guys have ever seen an eye roll before you even said what you're going to say? Oh, I know what you're going to say, so let me just get ahead of you, dad. And the eyes run like, oh, great, I'm in for. Uh, estrogen terrorist battle here, okay? Here we go. Let's go. 
And, and so Micah chapter 6, though, this, I want to read it like a sarcastic teenager because that's how I pick it up. God's going to have a case against you. I, I set you free. I delivered you. You intermarried. You started to water down your worship style, your pattern. And here's the response. What can we bring to you, Dad, Lord? Should we bring you burnt offerings? Should we bow before God most high with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Can you see? It's like, God's wanting them to come back. And he's like, they're like, sir, you want 10,000 10, rivers of, of olive oil? That's, that's a lot of grease in our septic systems in Fairbanks. Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? Okay, you, know, you, you want burnt offerings? Okay, if burnt offerings aren't enough, that's okay. We'll sacrifice our yielding calves. If, that, if that's not enough, I'll bring 10,000. I'll bring 1,000 rams. And if that's not enough, I'll bring you 10,000 rivers of olive oil. And on top of that, if that's enough, you can have my firstborn kid. Now, there's some parents who would like to give their firstborn kid away. Never mind. <laughs> Someone just said preach. Wow. Do you see the sarcasm here? There's a sarcasm, and here's what I think they're saying. If you back away from their sarcasm, I think you pick up this fact that they think God's an unfair God. I mean, come on. He's asking. His demands are heavy. There's a whole lot here. And, other, and I think the other part that's saying is we can't possibly please him. I mean, who has 10,000 rams in their backyard? Who has... You know, or a thousand rams. No, we don't. And so, but here's the thing. Here, here's, here, this is what I want to challenge us with, is sometimes we have a hard time distinguishing between God's voice and, and the voice of our earthly father who maybe we never were good enough with. So there's this tug of war. And in Christianity, it's not about how good we are and how many burnt offerings and how many rams and how many rivers of olive oil and how many firstborn children we sacrifice. It's not about what we can do because we, how many want to know, we can't do enough. In the Bible, the sinner, Jesus was hanging out with sinners and tax collectors and the religious people were like, well, why is he not hanging out with us? Because obviously we're ready. And can I just say something? If you think you're good enough for God, you're probably out. If you don't think you qualify for God, that's a prerequisite for you're probably in. Because he came for what? The sick. Who need a doctor. Not the healthy. And they, Micah comes and he gives a confrontation. They're like, oh, God. They kind of throw their hands up like, you know, this isn't going to work. When we tried you, God doesn't work. Now, here's the deal. How many want to know we don't try God? You try broccoli. You try asparagus. You try Brussels sprouts. You, 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 you go to, you know, I was in college. I remember having to try. Uh, my, 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 uh, my, my cousins um, married into a Norwegian family. I had to, I had to try Ludafisk and Lessa. You try that. And I tried it once. That's all I'm going to try. You don't try God. You commit to him. And, 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 and so Jesus, he, he, Micah steps in and goes, no, guys, you guys have misread it. It's not about uh, offering all these rams and all this stuff. You're, you're mis yeah, you're in judgment, but it's not about all the, that stuff. He says in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, oh, mortal, what is good? What does the Lord require of you? Not 10,000 rivers of olive oil, not 1,000 rams, not your firstborn son sacrificed. He, he requires of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Now, let me tell you something. You guys should memorize that verse. Have it on, your, on, on, on a windshield in your car. Memorize it. Have it on when you're shaving, men. Um, uh, uh, women, when you're pulling the eye. Never mind. Um, but you want to memorize it. God wants us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. It's a pretty good job description right there. In other words, what he's saying is, I want you to act like covenant kids. Now, this isn't any different than what Jesus talked about. When the Pharisees and tax collectors came to him, the Pharisees came to him and says, so, so what's the greatest commandment, Lord? They questioned him, what's the greatest commandment? Of all, he goes, to love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and love your 
neighbor as yourself. All the law, the first five books of the Bible, and the prophets are summed up in those two commands. And I want to show you right here with Micah, this is just a revert, inverted order. Walk humbly with God is to love God, is to realize that God loves you and you love him. You're not good enough without him, but God's grace has forgiven you. And so walk humbly with God. Is a, that's on the, the back end. But the, the first two talk about how do you treat your neighbor? Act justly. Love mercy. It's the same. Guys, if you want to boil this Bible down to what God really wants of us, I think Micah says it real well. Act justly. God requires that. Love mercy mercy. God loves that. And walk humbly with God. Walk. Say walk. walk. Then say attend church every week or once every three weeks, whatever your pattern of attendance is. Walk humbly with God. God, I need you to make it. God, I, I, I can't do without your strength. Last week we talked about pride and C.S. Lewis said, C.S. C. C. Lewis, or no, Steve Hart, I, I read a quote about pride that said, that said this, the, the, the epitome of pride is prayerlessness where you don't have the humility to realize you need God for help. Act like my kid. So and the, the, the defense turns it back to the prosecutor at this point. A couple of you like, I like this song. Some of you are going to go back and say, oh man, I, I missed a couple episodes. But Micah, this is what Micah 6 8 looks like, or doesn't look like. He goes on in Micah chapter 6, verse 9, he goes on and says, Listen, the Lord's calling to the city, and to fear his name and his wisdom. Heed the rod of the one who appointed it. In other words, heed the correction God has, and the one that's bringing it. I'm still. I, 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 am I still to forget your ill-gotten treasures, you wicked house? The short ephah. The, the ephah is a measurement. If you're highlighting or you're, you have a tree Bible, underline those things. Short ephah, ill-gotten, which is accursed. Shall I acquit someone with dishonest scales, with a bag of false weights? Your rich people are violent. Your inhabitants are liars, and their tongues speak deceitfully. Therefore, I have begun to destroy you, to ruin you because of your sins. You'll eat but not be satisfied. Your stomach will be empty. You'll store up for yourselves uh, and to save nothing because what you save, I've given. Uh, uh, I'll give to the sword. You will plant but not harvest. You'll press olive oils but not use its oil. You will crush grapes but not drink the wine. You've observed the statutes of Omri and the practices of Ahab's house, and you followed their traditions. Therefore, I'll give you over the ruin and your people to derision. He's going through this thing. He goes, man, there's, a, there's four things in this passage that he has. I, I, I have a struggle with you. If you're going to act justly, you're going to love mercy, you walk humbly with God, there's a couple things you're not doing. Let me point that out to you right now. Number one, you're dishonest in business. You have dishonest scales. You, your ifa is, is not, you, 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 you don't use the right source. God's looking and he says, I'm looking at how you interact with the people around you. How many want to know? The easiest place to serve Jesus is in church. Because everyone's around there. When I went to Bible college, I had a mentor that said, Mark, don't date anyone for three months. Go back to the second semester and see who still shows up for the prayer meeting. See who still shows up for Wednesday night service. See who still comes to Sunday night. He says, find out. In other words, what they were saying is everyone can serve God at Bible college the first month. But when they go back to their routines, can they keep doing it? The hardest place to serve God is away from the church building. Or in their sense, the, 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 the tabernacle that they, 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 were, they were walking through the desert with. Or that, that time, the temple actually they built, sorry. Uh, so, so he's going, he's going I, I'm looking at how you deal with people through business, your interactions, how you work with the people around you. Do you have corrupt weights? Do you have bad bids? Do you have the right ethics in your work? Do you deal with people correctly? How many ones, God cares about our day-to-day -day interactions with people in work and our lives? How do you treat your boss? How do you, how do you treat your employees? He said, he said, the second thing I have against you is you're violent. I, I, there's one thing I really struggle with lately. How, how, how we can't get along if we're from a different political party. Can I just say something? As God's people, we act justly, we love mercy, and we walk humbly with our God. And so we have to be careful, but he says he saw the violent, how they treated people, they disrespected people. And with their words, they, their tongues were sharp, the Bible says, and the Bible says they were liars. 
And then third, fourthly, he says, your religion is a sham. He says, you practice the statutes of Omri and Ahab. Ahab was married to a woman. Most of us have never named our daughter after Jezebel. She was an evil woman. And Ahab and Omri were two people who set up their own temples for worship. And, 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 and so the Israelites had kind of again, assimilated foreign worship into their, 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 their normal religious practice. He goes, you're not, you're not Christ followers. You, you, I'm part of you, but you have a whole lot of other stuff you worship. In other words, God's saying, I want to know, am I number one in your life? The defense has to answer that. So the defenses get up, and they uh, and, and 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 they they begin to point the finger as to why. Well, you know, it would be easier to serve God, but there's a lot of challenges in our culture. And they, the first challenge they point to is the government's messed up. We would never have that finger to point in America. And can I just say something? No matter who's in the White House, no matter who's in the governor's house, no matter who lives in our community as a borough mayor or, 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 or city mayor, no matter who lives in their house, our God still is on the throne. And we don't shift how we serve Jesus based upon if our government uh, it, it li lives. What, it, number one, I look for the throne of God for my leadership, not always the American government. So let's make sure we have our eyes on the right house. In Micah chapter 7, verse 3 says, But their hands are equally skilled in doing evil. Officials and judges alike, they, they demand bribes, the people with influence get what they want, and they scheme to twist justice. It doesn't sound like America at all, does it? There's problems with officials and judges, and, 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 and those that have influence get more influence because they twist things, and those with no voice get less and less and less and less. And that's why God has a problem. And their point is, you know, in fact, it goes, so, so what, 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 what the, God's people are saying is, hey, our government's messed up. And the second thing they say is our neighborhoods, our cities are messed up. In Micah chapter 7, the godly people have all disappeared in other words, there's no one around us serving Jesus around us. Our, we're, we're, it's all messed up. Not one honest person's left on the earth. They're all, they're all murderers. They're setting traps for each other and even their own brothers. And in verse 5, you can't trust anyone, even your best friend. In other words, society's not what it used to be. And then number three, our homes are all messed up. They're pointing things that go from government to our city or neighborhoods, to what? Our homes. And Micah says, don't trust anyone, not your best friend, your wife. Your... <laughs> There's a problem when you can't trust your spouse. If you're a single gal or guy in here, can I give you a real good hint? I had someone tell me once, Mark, marry someone who talks good about their dad when their dad's not around because that's how they'll talk about you. And guess what? You know why I married Heidi? Because I met Heidi at summer camp. She was leading worship, and I was a youth pastor. And all she talked about was her daddy, how her daddy got saved out of drugs and alcohol. The same story her daddy tells me all the time I see him. And, and, and I know that, 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 that when Heidi's not with me, she's talking good about me because the way she talked about her daddy. That's, just, that's free. That's not a part of the message, but that might help some of you as you look for a spouse. But homes, it says, it says, it says the, the son despises the father, the daughters defy the mother, the daughters-in-law defies the mother-in-law. Your enemies are right in your own household. In other words, you get a place where people in their own household. How many, you look at that slide and go, oh my goodness, you got homes, you got, and how, here's the deal. The homes, the basic, the, a marriage is the basic building block of society. How many of you know that? I can't change the government. You know what I can change? I can change my house. And if my house gets changed, my house might be able to influence our city. And if the city gets changed, the city can influence the state, and the state can influence the globe. And then, then the godly people like Kelly go, I'm going to run because I do feel like we need, God, and we need godly leaders in places of leadership. How many of you guys agree with that? Yeah. I'm not saying we don't need it all. I'm saying it, 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 as you look at this, they're pointing all the reasons why they have failed serving Yahweh God. And then Micah steps in and goes, let me give a verdict. Let me, let me tell you, you're pointing to how messed up life is, but here's where you start. And friends, maybe your home life is messed up. 
Maybe you don't, you feel like you kind of got born on the wrong side of the tracks and life has kind of thrown you a mess and you're sitting here trying to get some equilibrium because life's messed up. There's a day you had drugs and now drugs have you. I don't know your story, but I know this. Micah pauses. They point all the fingers. And he says, okay, let, let me kind of boil it down to two verdicts. Number one, start with personal commitment regardless of the mess. Start with personal commitment regardless of the mess. I don't know what to do. Well, the next step is do the next right thing. Start with a personal commitment. I, 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 in other words, I'm doing my part, and I love what, 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 what Micah says. He's going, take responsibility and obey. Take personal responsibility. Don't pass the buck. In Micah chapter 7, verse 7, but as for me, I watch and hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. He'll hear me. Verse 9, because I've sinned against him, I bear the Lord's wrath until he pleads my case and upholds my cause. He will bring me out into the light. I will see his righteousness. Righteous. In other words, I take responsibility for my sin, and I know that God will now take responsibility for my... God now steps in and, and, and labors. How many want to know we have a defense lawyer in heaven? His name is Jesus. He took our sins upon him. We have to take responsibility. If you're here today and you, you blame everyone for your life, you're probably going to stay in that cycle until you take responsibility for your life and your choices. Admit your sin, acknowledge it, own it, and ask him to forgive it. In Micah chapter 7, verse 14, it says, shepherd your people with your staff. In other words, do your part to lead the people you're responsible for. And then secondly, Verdict number two is the judge delights in mercy, grace, and forgiveness. The Lord delights in mercy, grace, and forgiveness. How many of you guys are thankful that God delights in mercy? In Micah chapter 7, it says, who, verse 18, who is a God like you who pardons sins and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. In other words, we have a God who pardons us. We have a God who forgives us. And we have a God who shows mercy. Anyone want to be a part of a relationship with Jesus, that, should, that type of God? He starts out, I have a case against you. But he ends with, but you know something? There's something called mercy and grace if you come and confess your sins. I'm faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I can make you, I can change your life and transform you. I can pardon, forgive, and show mercy. And then lastly, let's just quick, quickly for those of you that are melancholic, let me just give you a couple blanks to fill in. There's, there, 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 what, what does the judge require? He, acts, he, he requires justice. And justice it is using our power in a fair and just way. Using our power and our influence in a fair and just way. As a parent, we act fairly. As an employer, we act fairly. As an employee, we act fairly. We act fairly. We become a voice. We don't have power to be powerful. We have power to show justice. And number two, mercy. Love to be loving, especially the hard to love. If you want to know your person of mercy... And I, 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 your pastor's on a major growth journey with this. On my spiritual gifts test, I rank zero in mercy. Mercy does not come normal for your pastor. But the more I read, I'm going like, oh my goodness, God is a God of mercy. If I want to look like God, God better do us in really deep surgery on Mark's heart and Mark's life. And Mark needs to have a little bit more mercy. Mark needs to understand what grace looks like. I need to be love. I need to love. I need to love to be loved, and I, have to, I have especially have to love those that are hardest. Anyone here have people in their heart, life that are hard to love? God put them there so you can develop something called mercy. Faithfulness. You might say, well, faithfulness isn't that, is, is in, in, this, in this list. Yeah, it is. Walk humbly. Walk. It's not like a one-time thing. It's every day I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to step up, and then I'm going to get up the next day, I'm going to, I'm going to, and I'm going to walk this thing out with God. I'm going to be faithful. Faithfulness is a consistent, unwavering, firm belief. I'm going to act justly, faithfully. I'm going to love mercy, and I'm going to walk. It's not a checklist. It's a walk. 
Oh, I did my good deed of justice today. Did my good deed of mercy today. No, you walk this thing out every day, everywhere you go. And lastly, you walk humbly with what? God. Hum humility. Humility is the proper view of yourself. Now, maybe you're here today. And I could go into detail and, 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 and time, time, time won't allow us to do that this morning. But maybe you're here today and you don't have a personal relationship with God. Here's the deal. It's appointed once for man to die and after that to face judgment. We all have an appointment with death, an appointment we can't cancel, an appointment we can't shift our calendar around for, an, account, an appointment we're not too busy for. Guess what? Death happens when death wants it to happen, when God wants it to happen. We're all appointed once for man to die. And after death, there's a case. God's going to put the law in order of music and you go, oh, it's my turn now. Yes. And the question I have for you is this. If you died today, when you're online, you're listening to a correctional facility, or you're in the auditorium, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? We often say it like this in True North. There's an expiration date on the milk carton of all of our lives. We're not promised tomorrow. And here's the question. Here's the reality. If you leave this place today and forget me or any of our volunteers, serve team members, you haven't lost a whole lot. But if you leave here today and forget who Jesus Christ is, you have lost everything. If you're here today and you're not, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're backslidden, you used to, you got stationed up here, you hit raw, hard, rock time, hard times and you came to church, I don't know your story, but I know this, it's important once you're going to die and about that to face judgment. Are you ready? We always say true north is as easy as A, B, C, to begin a relationship with Jesus. A, admit you sin. B, believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And C, confess Jesus as the Lord of your life. A, admit, B, believe, C, confess. Take responsibility for your sin, for your life, for your choice. Don't blame everybody else. Take responsibility. I admit, and God, I believe you're the only one that can save me. You have mercy. You'll forgive my transgressions. And God, I, I confess you as the life leader of my life. If you've never prayed that prayer, I'd love to pray with you. You bow your heads and close your eyes all across this room this morning. You're here. You've never begun a relationship with Jesus. You want to begin a relationship. You want to, you want to come back and recommit a relationship. Maybe you've backslidden. You've fallen away from God. You've lost spiritual traction. And you need some spiritual blizzx today to get back online. Just pray this prayer. Sounds that prayer out loud. Dear Jesus, today, I admit I've sinned. But I believe you died on the cross to forgive me. Please forgive me for my sins today. I confess my need for you. You died on the cross to forgive me. I need that. And today, I confess you as the Lord of my life. I choose to make you my life leader. Help me serve you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Bible says there's more rejoice in heaven when one person prays that prayer the 99 people already prayed. Would you give it up for those who prayed that prayer for the first time today? Whether you're here online, if you're online, instructions will come up if you prayed that prayer. But if you're here in person on the side of your worship guide, you prayed that prayer, we'd like to connect with you. On the side of your worship guide, there's a place to put your name, email, phone number, check the box. I made a decision to follow Jesus today. And uh, we have people every week that pray this prayer. We call people, we talk to them. If you give us your information, we'll connect with you. We'll, we'll, we'll try to find someone that can help coach you, mentor you, walk the path with you, help you serve Jesus. It's really important for us that that's the next step you take. We'd like to connect with you. If you're just interested in water baptism, some of those things, uh, next week we have a water baptism service, our, our fourth and third gathering here. And then just tear this off. And our usher is going to come at this time. And we're waiting on you for Lord's tithes and offerings. And just drop that in the bucket when it goes by, if you'd be so kind. Um, just want to say thank you for your generosity. This last week, we had all these kids around here. You probably, when you walked in, you noticed that four years got some spills. Well, you know, you have 400 people here. The kids are going to spill Kool-Aid on the carpet, right? And so this next week, we'll get the, we'll get the carpets clean, those things. And, um, but I'll tell you right now, I'd rather have dirty carpet and a bunch of kids who hear about Jesus than clean carpet and no kids, right? And I want to say thank you for all your help. We had 100 workers, and, and about 80 of them stayed here. We had, like, a camp in between, and, and, and uh, 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 with teenagers, we had speakers, powerful for, for teenagers, powerful for kids, um, and, and that happens because of you, and uh, all the food was donated, and, and, and thank you so much. And, um, uh, but at the same time, that's happened, and we started digging, digging our footings on College Road. I want to show you the picture of College Road. Um, 
uh, uh, they started digging the, the footings here, and they're going to start building the forms and pouring some cement. And, and uh, uh, a year and a half from now, we're going to have uh, uh, an incredible uh, uh, place where the foyer is 135 feet wide by 40 feet wide, and we're going to have a lot of discipleship happening there before service, after service, during service. And uh, but I want to say thank you. It's your generosity that puts us in that place to build that building, but not to build buildings alone, guys, to touch kids' lives during the week. And uh, it's not about a building. We don't build buildings. We build people. But at 40 below, it's kind of nice to put people you're building in a building. And so I want to thank you for your generosity, consistent help us as we touch our city. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. I pray a blessing on, the, on, the, on, the, on this offering. Bless the gift and the giver today. Help us to be faithful stewards of the resources of this church, your people, to, to, to uh, impact our city, our state, and the globe. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand with us as we close. If you have a guest card or worship response card, drop it in the bucket when it goes by. Let's sing the song as we close today. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. How are you thankful the battle belongs to God? And because the battle belongs to Him, we're gonna see what? Victory. I'm going to pray over you, but I, my prayer is you go out today and, and, and uh, get, get ready to read the book of Nahum. You're, you're, you're going to see a side of God that we don't always see. But we got to look at those aspects of who God is, the character of God, and how he loves his people, and how he hates those who hurt his people. He, he, he doesn't like seeing his people hurt. And so read that book. We'll have a lot of fun next week. Invite a friend if you think they'd enjoy this series. Let me pray a blessing. Lord, I pray a blessing over everyone here. God, go with them as they go their separate ways. We thank you for that. And God, we lift up Kelly Shabaka to you today. God, we thank you that as a godly woman in, in our culture, in our day, she says yes. Yes to serving. Yes to putting herself out there. Yes to running. I pray for favor and grace as she does this on her family, on her, on her husband, on her children, Lord, and ultimately on her campaign. We thank you for that. And God, again, go with us as we go our separate ways today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, church, God loves you. I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Have a great week. God bless. of